Hey everyone, Kuro the Artist here, and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. Charmcaster has been around since the classic series, and now that we're three series and nine seasons in, she's had plenty of appearances to become a fan favorite. But as much as we've seen her, we really didn't get to find out too much about her until this episode. But here, once we finally tackle what makes Charmcaster who she is, it opens up the opportunity for redemption. We have countless villains in Ben 10 who are relentlessly and unapologetically evil. So when we get characters that have more of a gray area to them, it makes you want to see if there's a better side to them. Some of them, like Michael, seem to be too far gone, or at least too stubborn to ever change, while others, like Kevin and Hex, eventually make it to the greener side. Charmcaster rode the line pretty tightly her whole run, but UA gave her that extra push to show us that it's possible. It was revealed by Duncan that her redemption was something that they've always wanted to do for her, but never got a chance to commit to it, and when we got to UAF, there was a lot of crew on board for it. One writer, Jeffrey Thorne, was a huge defender of Charmcaster's redemption back in the day, and while unfortunately it seems like a lot of his original statements are lost to time, there was a recent Twitter thread from 2020 that delves into his thoughts and disappointment with how her character was mishandled beyond his control. By Omniverse, it seems like the character lost all of her relatability and went full on nuts. And while you could chalk it up to her inability to cope with the rejection of her father's resurrection, it was really just because the current vibe of the series didn't see her like the older ones did. Now this isn't to say her redemption was an easy path, as not long after this episode, she literally kills the main trio as a sacrifice to offer their souls to Dagon. But if we're gonna take that as a reason for her not to be redeemed, well, it's not like the other villains who got redeemed had an easy path to follow either. But this episode gives us our first real look at Charmcaster. So if this is your first breakdown and you're curious about how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below, along with a link to all my previous breakdowns, but by all means, watch this video first, I'm sure you'll still enjoy it. I got two quick updates for you. For one, a channel called Blind Wave started reacting to Ben 10 recently. I've been a big fan of them for a while now, and they're pretty much the only reaction channel that I consistently watch. And it's cool to see new content creators have a look at the series and see what they think. So go check them out. I'll link them down below. Also, you saw that intro correctly. The next and beyond episode will be about Ledger Domain. There's no release date as of yet, but we've been working on this one for quite a while now, and there's dozens of behind the scenes sneak peeks over on our Patreon, including for 5YL. So if you want to support these episodes and more like them in the future, please check us out over there. I'll link that down below as well. Now, on to the episode. Where the Magic Happens first aired October 29th, 2010, and was written by Matt Wayne. The trio's third attempt at obtaining a piece of the map Infinity leads them to the mystical realm of Ledger Domain, where they have to team up with Charmcaster in order to enter and then survive. They learn of her people's enslavement by the mystical tyrant Adwecha, who is in command of the Alpha Rune, which is secretly the third piece of the map. As they fight their way towards Adwecha's citadel, Greg catches up once more. Just getting right into it. This is a pretty big episode, so I guess jumping right into the action is a smart move in terms of pacing. I don't think it really matters how we got here. Although, where is here? Looks like a desert in the background, but a different kind of desert. And alas, the door to anywhere. The door itself does teleport around, but because there's also structures around it that kind of complement the same style of material this is made of, I think this is its original location, and it defaults back to here whenever it's not being summoned. Yawatuxip. I know that's supposed to be a reference to something. I can't seem to find it, though. Love how it materializes in from these little bead animations instead of just fading in and the light rays shooting out. Good stuff. <laughs> So sometimes when we see the door open, we actually see the other side of where it leads to, but right now it's just an ambiguous pink portal, perhaps just to keep the mysticism for the audience. <sighs> When's being affected by its aura. That's the door to anywhere. You have to know the true name of the place you're going. I wonder how Greg knew the true name. No problem. You remember all that just from looking at it? Sure. Honestly, when it comes to short term, it's really not that hard if you train yourself. If y'all have been following my Keeping It Fizzy channel, you'll know I do a lot of live events where I draw people's faces, and I get a lot of pets or little kids, and they don't stand still for anything. So I've gotten very used to, like, memorizing the quick two, three second glances I get at them before they start, like, moving around, and being able to sketch it out. So while Ben might not have a perfect photographic memory in the long term, I still think this is pretty realistic. Speak the word, and the door will open. Wadita! You have no idea you had to read that stuff, do you? <laughs> well, she was kind of close. With these symbols, I'm surprised she was even able to try. I'm self-taught. So who does? You know somebody. Wait here. Who could it be? 
Also, look at that. A teleportation spell. So now of the four times we've seen her teleport, only one of them actually caused her issues. So maybe it's the kind of teleportation spell? Because they do always look different. I don't know, man. Sometimes she could just do things. Ah, uh, yes. A giant blank book. Let's just say only magic users can read the text. I need your help. Her little crown brim here is colored purple instead of black. Man, I really like the look of their castle. Even the window design is pretty neat. Looks a bit sanctum sanctorium -y. I was just thinking about you. It's cool that her bag floats at a different pace than Charmcaster. The Staff of Ages. I guess that's just hers now. <laughs> Nice. Gwen's got Charmcaster beat on magic and martial arts. This is a great looking episode so far. I wonder if the staff has a consciousness when it turns into a snake, or if it's just magically animated. The place was practically made out of mana! Made of mana? See, this teleportation spell already looks different than the one from earlier. Victory for Gwen. You trust her? I trust her staff is in the back first chance she gets. It's pretty noble of Gwen to put aside their differences for the sake of defeating Greg. Ledger Domain. Wow, you weren't even close. <laughs> Ledger Domain is what the natives call it. Yeah, this is some big sandy desert. Very different from the desert we usually see. I have no idea where they are right now. Now the symbols just fade in instead of the bubbly effect. Everything in this episode's looking great so far. See, here we actually see the other side instead of an ambiguous portal. But then this teleports away. It's smaller than I remember. The architecture in here is very neat. Could use a little bit more elaboration. Maybe some forests and vegetation around here. But I'm loving the rock structures. It's different enough to set itself apart from the null void. I feel powerful. All the magic in the universe flows from this dimension. So Ledger Domain is a magical conduit. It's smart to add the extra effects to show Gwen's increase in power when she's here. The Alpha Rune is the secret true name of magic. So are Charmcaster's eyes purple or blue? Because they're always switching. I feel like at this point it doesn't matter, but what do you personally like? Do you think Charmcaster looks better with purple eyes or blue eyes? Let me know down below. Whoever holds it has power over magic itself. How do you have power over magic itself? Because from what we've gathered from the series so far, magic is just the practice of manipulating mana. And even though they're kind of interchangeable, does this mean that you dictate everybody's spells or whatnot and can prevent people from casting things, or you just become uber powerful? Because that's a very vague statement. You think this alpha rune is a piece of the map of infinity? It's always disguised as whatever's hardest to get. Very true. Between the center of the temple and the core of Piscus, it's always hidden somewhere very elaborate. Adwecha, most powerful mystic who ever lived. We first heard name dropped by Galapagos in Escape from Agrigor. Thank Adwecha, it worked. A very obscure hint at the true species of Adwecha. Stay with me. God, this steep hill must be killing their thighs. Yeah, even the ground animation, this episode looks really great so far. Kinda wish Deep had this kind of love. What you call magic is powered by mana, or, or life energy. Okay, so perhaps Charmcaster just doesn't know the distinction between mana and magic, but at the same time, I feel like she should know that. Especially after their encounter in Alien Force. You don't know anything, idiot savant! Someone's getting jealous. Words have power, Caroline. Looks like Kevin also holds a grudge with Charmcaster playing him. Sometimes I forget that other people lie too. <laughs> yeah, I really do dig the look of Ledger Domain so far. But I could just have a touch of more care of detail into the terrain. But this is one of those instances where I feel like Omniverse went way too far. Like, I, I do not like Omniverse's Ledger Domain at all. It doesn't bite. Here we got the remains of a civilization. Guess that witch's reign has traveled. <laughs> It's the rock monsters! This is our first time seeing rock monsters outside of Charmcaster summoning them. They seem very savage and rabid, compared to Ignatius, the intelligent one we meet later on. I love how this guy spits up some rocks as he's growling at them. Erotico! Gwen's powers are awesome in here. Although I feel like she's generally this powerful anyways. I guess Ledger Domain just makes it easier for her. The sky and the earth are in parallel here! That's very trippy. Really wonder how that's supposed to work though. Like, is it a gravity sort of thing? Or is the reality around here just subtly warping the further away you go from the center of the path? Low and Jet Ray's flying down at them. All of the rock monsters and the other characters aren't present at all. Yeah, later knowing that these are all like a lot more sentient than they're appearing here kind of makes this a bit more rough. 
Yeah, everything in this episode, at least animation-wise, is looking fantastic. It does not look like they're slacking so far. Why don't you just order them around? The others followed me because I'd freed them. But they also get destroyed a lot. Like, if we're gonna act like each rock monster that she's ever summoned was an individual that she'd freed, she must have had, like, hundreds on reserve. She only summons maybe about five at a time. But once they're destroyed, like, that's it, right? Can they come back from that? Or are these same guys just getting destroyed over and over again? And if so, what about the birds or the little dog ones? Why don't I believe anything you say to me? It's very subtle, but this is a really good looking shot with all of the layers. Each one of these things is on its own layer, and it gives a lot of depth to the shot when they're walking. You see that perspective shift? I've been dealing with these things since I was a kid. I was born here. And Charmcaster's origin is revealed. So even in classic, it's not directly said that she's human or not, so I'm not entirely sure if this would be a retcon or just an elaboration. But at least with Ultimate Alien, there's subtle things like, you know, the odd colored eyes and the pointed ears that makes her seem a bit less human. And, you know, Hex having blue skin in classic was a bit out there as well, but that could have just been a side effect from using magic or whatever. You should have never returned. What's this? Is John DiMaggio voicing another deep voice threatening character? And which it does have an awesome design, though. Except with the way his claws and body is positioned, it doesn't look like he'd be able to do his Terra Spin attack anymore. Maybe his body was magically modified, or I guess just some of his species look like this. Of great Adwaitia. Can't even say his own name right. <laughs> Uh, so even though he's like a magic hologram, he can interact directly with the plane that they're currently on. That's pretty cool. Seeing the ground manipulate into vines. That's some advanced terrakinesis right there. Although Cannonbolt does look a little wonky in this scene, but there's a lot happening. And there's been some pretty great animation so far, so you know, not every shot could be perfect. All that lives steals mana from me. This has got to be some kind of error, with his fire being visible through the transparency of the shell. I think what happened is the fire and the body shell layers were both lined up in the shot and then each individually turned transparent, rather than fusing these two layers together first, then turning the fused layers together transparent. The Alpha Rune is mine. So the Alpha Rune is super intertwined with their culture. So how does that work with the sense of the map? The map's power could have been transformed into this stone, and thus their whole way of life is built around this piece. But this is the most elaborate piece of the map. Everything else was just kind of there? Wait, no, I guess on Ripjaws' homeworld. You know, how did that homeworld exist before the map as well? The temple and the perplexohedron are one thing, but the planet's core and the alpha rune are so intertwined with the environments and the people around them, it's like they wouldn't be able to exist without the map piece. I wonder if these are real flowers. Crazy that she was able to determine what exactly this would impact as it disintegrated all of the rocks and blew away at Weicha, yet everybody else is fine. Follow me! You don't know where to go! Also, look at this ball animation. This is, this is a new one. See the plates stretching? Yeah, that's, that's a bit odd. I'm convinced there's no, like, actual model sheet or, like, diagram showing how Cannibal is supposed to roll up, because animators seem to just make it up every single time, even back in Classic. That thing around his neck. Where is everybody? They're, like, the only ones here. Not many buildings or anything either. Like, is this just because of Adwecha, or is it always this barren around Ledger Domain? <laughs> These things are pretty basic looking though. They should have brought back the charm bird models. What are those things? They're at Weich's eyes and ears. All right, well, I guess that makes sense on why they look the way they do. <laughs> the Ultimate Matrix has its night colors, even though it's usually the exact same shade of green as his jacket. The background blurs until Chromastone has time to adjust into his position. <laughs> Pretty smart for him to be Chromastone too. Except right here you see Kevin's hands fade from being a shape into his regular hands. I don't think we've ever seen this type of error before. Working on it. Ooh. Yeah, this is cool. So it's like a special kind of magic shield. Cool. I know, right? Well man, he is seriously off model right now. These rocks are really neat. See, even just having some of these rocks, throwing them in all the emptier spaces of Ledger Domain to fill up the scene, that would have been fine. I just think there needs to just be more things happening here. It, it doesn't even need to be complicated. Even black silhouette shapes, for all I care, just, you know, it's almost too barren. Not quite as bad as Rip Jaws' homeworld in Deep. I mean, yeah, so far Ledger Domain, it, it looks pretty nice. And all the effort to put the many objects on different layers really helps with the depth here. I'd feel better if we were still invisible. Is that what that spell did? It looked like it was controlling them almost. In fact, this flatland 
land here looks perspective warped, like the texture of the ground is mapped onto a 3D object. Maybe some of your people could help us. True, where is everybody? There aren't many left. Oh, okay. Well, at least there's a canon answer. But Weicha enslaved everyone. Well, being enslaved, you know, they'd still be somewhere, right? Are they all, like, in a dungeon or something right now? My father died getting me and Uncle Hex out of here. But that's gotta be rough. I love that we're getting some legitimate backstory for Charmcaster and Hex. I actually kind of would have been dope if Hex tagged along, too. It might have been too much of a buffer for Charmcaster and Gwen to have this bond that they're starting to develop here if Hex was also along for the ride, but I just like Hex, you know? I, I wouldn't mind a little bit more of him. Maybe if he was at least in the opening scene or something. End of the line. Hear that? You're not worth it. That sounds like Yuri Lowenthal. He's getting a lot of background roles lately. Good for him. I hope he gets paid more for that. Lost cause. That sounds a bit like Harry Walgren. I hear my father's voice. He doesn't sound anything like that. Hope, is it really you? You've grown. Yes, dear. It's me. We're all here. Maybe that's part of the trick, though. It might not literally sound like it, but the magical enchantment is starting to confuse her mind. Daddy. We can be together again. Oh, that's rough. I wonder what would happen if she stepped in there though, because there's no real ground below them. Would she fall forever or just like somehow disintegrate? I wonder what's down there. I like that little perspective shift when she starts to take a step. The terrain of Ledger Domain is pretty plain compared to what you might desire for a magical realm, but cinematically, this episode looks fantastic. <laughs> Nasty trick. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely a magical barrier because she made a shield that was like three miles long one time. It's a mystic sinkhole. You don't have enough power. Except if you use friendship no jutsu. We're a team. You know, it would be really cool if Ben turned into Terra Spin and all three of them put their powers together to create the bridge. But again, it, it would kind of ruin the bond that Charmcaster and Gwen are building. But with how much Terra Spin species is intertwined with mana, it's kind of disappointing we don't get to see how Terra Spin would interact with this world. Sort of like how Ben didn't go ultimate big chill in front of the next Refugian temple. There's a lot of teases of possibility here. They did it. The power of friendship. Yeah, I really like them as buddies. I think there definitely needs to be a build up to it. Like we already kind of had to accept that Kevin just instantly turned on their side. And like, you know, it wasn't instant, but it, it was pretty fast. So I like that at the end of this, she's not immediately like good. But this really sets up for a potential friendship in the future that I would have enjoyed if it came to fruition. Plus with the whole Gwen saying she's self-taught at the beginning, it could have been foreshadowing to Charmcaster taking her under her wing and training her to become a master. But I also guess that's what she goes to school for in Omniverse anyway. Anyways. You want me dead? Maybe just badly hurt? See? Progress. Like, you can't deny there's something being seeded there. It's sad to see it fall apart. Not every villain should be redeemable, but when you start planting the seeds for it, it kind of makes you want it. Here's some plant life. Sadwaitch's castle. Sadwaitch's citadel. Citadel. Sorry. <laughs> This thing is pretty neat looking. He's like Spitter's aggressive older brother. Let me out. Ooh, I love that little magic glow on the staff. When Gwen's shield breaks, the pieces fall down in a fluttering way like confetti instead of the usual glass. Damn, Kevin's strong as fuck if he's doing this without armor. <laughs> it's neat whenever Kevin absorbs something and he gets extra textures from it. <laughs> This is an awesome shot. Although I think cutting to a close-up of the Ultimatrix ruins the pacing of it. It would have been better if it was sort of continuous. Like if we just cut that scene right there and... But like, it would look better if it was animated to be like that, but... I feel like the fluid motion of it is better than stopping to get the close-up of the hologram. He's giving it the works. Ooh, nice save. It's Adwecha. The black flaming head looks so dope. My might has long since cowed. At least John's giving him a slightly different voice than Agrigor and Ragnarok. Those two sound pretty similar, but Adwecha is, is more distinct. My father? You actually managed to hurt me. That is surprising since he has the alleged powerful Alpha Rune. <laughs> So it seems like he has to activate the power of the Alpha Rune in order to get it to work. Or at least for this specific spell, the Rippling Defense. Why return? He'll never control us all. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Keep going ham on him. Shit's getting serious. Oh, Ben. <laughs> It's really great that Charmcaster's magic does look visually distinct from Gwen's. Gwen's is a lot more solid objects and Charmcaster's is more fluid and loose. We've seen Gwen have this type of magic before too, but hers is like more refined, perhaps because she's just a more precise person. 
I love how the explosions are orange, but then they cool to a purple smoke color. Ooh, and his magic is more purple than pink, or at least this shield is. And yeah, he's gotta hold on to the alpha rune to activate its power. It's also a good candy cap, like how MCU Thanos has to close his fist to use one of the stones. More terraforming. More flowers too! You can actually see all of the different flowers individually, instead of it being an ambiguous pile of yellow. Oh, that's neat. This is sort of a similar thing that happened when Gwen tried to use her powers as Diamond Head in a future episode. Although it wages fire casting a shadow, that's... that's not good. It wages attacks always look so powerful. He's a lot greener than he normally is. Maybe it's just the lighting. Usually he's got more hint of a muted blue in there. And here when it zooms out, his hands are already like this. You don't see the morph animation. But you do hear the sound effect. Find out. It's Greg! Aw, oh, shit. I totally forgot he was even in this episode. Man's looking like a badass 24-7. So does this mean Amphibian could give him the same type of electrocution too? Or are all of the Andromeda powers interwoven with each other to give them different buffs? Like, perhaps this shock is more than just Ampiri. Judging by the shape of it and the art style that usually represents radiation in UAF, it could be a hybrid between Ampiri and Prepitosi and B energies. <laughs> I'm still trying. So this time the map looks a little bit different. It creates sort of a Mobius strip pattern instead of just being a flat shape of the Infinity logo. And hold on, what? Man's starting to teleport now? Or is this just the way they're animating his wind? No, that's, that's a teleport. Look at that, it even goes into the air. Is his ship here too? All right, I just found a quote from Dwayne that says, this is the Alpha Rune teleporting him out of Ledger Domain. So I guess that makes sense. Maybe it should have been more pink though. Also, it'd be nice if some of these flowers were being kicked up by the wind. My power, gods! Well, they're all just chilling there, waiting for orders. That's gotta be boring. Yeah, both of their magics really do look different all the time. I love it. Alpha Rune was holding a lot of this place together. Yeah, so how would this place exist without the map? Paradox must have hid this like when time began for this realm. If society is really this dependent on the rune. Maybe it's just this castle. Oh no. I can't believe it. Hydragor did it to me again. Congratulations, you played yourself. See, why are these things still serving Adwecha if he doesn't have the rune? We need that doorway back! This is my chance to stop Adwecha! I could break his control! Alright, so he still has control. I guess the rune just gave him, like, immense power to maintain that control. Gore first, and I promise to come back here. It's the door! I'll cover you! Caster. A brave sacrifice for her people. Ah, come on. Why do they always forget to switch him back to base form first? Runes for Ledger Domain are gone. Whoa, what is this pattern? Where are they? Is this even Earth anymore? She knew this would happen. With the Alpha Room gone, there's no way to get back to Ledger Domain. That's not true. Someday we're going back to help her. We've only got one more chance to stop Agrigor. You know, I always liked this episode, but this episode was executed much better than I remembered. And I'm very happy with that. Simply put, I really think this episode deserves a five in a plot. It's not world ending or crazy or anything like that. But like video games, it takes its concept and plays it to the best of its abilities. We got a lot of extensive development for Charmcaster and Hex. More elaboration on how magic and mana are intertwined in the Ben 10 universe. And another unique area to explore in the Map of Infinity arc. With everything that happened in this episode, like I said, it was smart to just start things off in the middle of the chase in the beginning. And the pacing of this episode was pretty great. It slowed down enough to get those character development scenes, but not too much where the episode started to drag on. And when it picked up, it picked up very well. If there was one thing I dislike is that we really didn't get much of Greg, and we haven't really gotten much of Greg all season. For being Ultimate Alien's big bad, he's kind of just a beginning and end of the episode kind of character. It's starting to get to the point where I wish he would stick around a little bit longer, but that desire doesn't hinder the plot of this episode at all. Characterization will also get a 5. While the last episode was kind of phoning it in, these characters do feel three-dimensional again, and there was a lot of great callbacks to previous continuity moments, while still giving us something new to build upon these characters more. Adway 
was kind of just another typical bad guy, but he was interesting enough where it didn't matter. We don't get that many magic villains in Ben 10, so any addition to the roster is great, and I think Edwacha fits right in, and I love the developing bond between Gwen and Charmcaster. In classic, Charmcaster really was strung around by Hex a lot, and although she did have her own ambitions, she seemed to just be a victim of the world she was brought up in, and that was clear even back then. You could see inklings and hints of an underlying humanity in there. And as for Gwen, well, she was 10 years old. Of course, she's gonna have very simplified emotions and reactions to things, but now that both of these characters are much older, and they know a lot about each other with all the struggles they've gone through, it's not like they can just instantly start being friends, but they can start seeing things from a more gray area perspective. And I think Charmcaster is one of the characters that explores this perfectly. She's definitely still in the evil category right now, but she's able to put aside her grudges and bitterness for her own sake. She's not blinded by her rivalry with Gwen to the point where she won't work with her for the greater cause, but she's still not morally sound and does try to kill them later. Visuals, like I said earlier, cinematically this episode is fantastic, but Ledger Domain is pretty plain when it comes down to it. And while there's a lot of great special effects in this episode, the terrain's made of rocks, the creatures are made of rocks, Edwacha uses rocks for battle, I just feel like there could have been more of a magical variety in the realm of magic. The animation is fantastic though, and I love Edwacha's design here. Importance is a solid 5. Not only does this continue the Map of Infinity arc, but also develops Charmcaster as a character more. She starts upgrading from recurring villain to almost a passive supporting character, not quite part of the main cast or even supporting cast, but she's becoming important enough to generate a lot of interest for her character, and this does lead to later threads in both Ultimate Alien and Omniverse. And entertaining, I'll give it a 4. As much as I'm giving this episode praise, it is held back by just being another piece in the Map of Infinity arc, and while I love all of the character development scenes, it's not for everybody, but that still leaves this episode off at a 22 out of 25. The hype for the Map of Infinity arc has shot right back up after that little hurdle we were in, and I'm happy to have an episode like this to add to the overall story. One thing I forgot to say during my characterization rating is I found Ben so much funnier in this episode than usual, like Kevin levels of dry humor, and I gotta say it works for him. Sometimes it's nice when the joke is the character making a joke rather than them being a joke, but I like buffoonish Ben Tennyson moments anyways, I'm just saying I like when they switch things up. Last week's poll was also met with another landslide, as most people's favorite map piece episode was Perplexo Hendren, and I couldn't agree more. I'm considering giving that one a full breakdown if I have the time, because it's based on an old movie Cube, which I at least remember sorta enjoying, but we'll see if it works out for my schedule. For this week's poll, I'm giving you hard and fast binary options. Yes or no. Would you have wanted to see Charmcaster's redemption? Let me know what you think in the community tab when this video goes live. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your weekend. And as always, keep it fizzy. Cool.